Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to get back in our Father's Word here. Sennacherib is right at the outskirts of Jerusalem. I mean, ready to just wipe it off. But he is a type of Antichrist, so he said, hey, come out and um, give me a gift and, and I will take care of you. You'll have your own vine, your own vineyard. You'll have everything will be prepared for you. This is the message really of the false Messiah coming in prosperously and peacefully in the great book of Daniel. God had authorized back in the 10th chapter in verses 5 and 8, Sennacherib to going to use the king of Assyria as a rod to correct Judah. But Sennacherib kind of overplayed his hand. And he, he began to, he, uh, he, he had given him a good Bible lesson, quite frankly, starting out in this same chapter we're finishing today. When he told them, he said, don't, don't tell me that you put your trust in Almighty God because you've destroyed all of his works and put up idols. And that's coming from a heathen, that would be kind of tough, okay? So having said that, chapter 36, verse 21, let's pick it up, let's go with it. But they held their peace and answered him not a word from the king's commandment, for the king's commandment was saying, answer him not. There comes a time when you want to hold your peace, okay? 22, then came Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, that was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, to Hezekiah, with their clothes rent, and told him the words of Reb, um, Rabshakeh. I mean, they were scared. They were frightened and they felt bad. They were weeping. It is amazing to me how that some people here, these people leaned on Pharaoh down in Egypt rather than going to Almighty God. They didn't even consult God. Tried to use him to prop themselves up and all he was was a reed and let them down. What is amazing is how people will really turn back to God and put on the, the sackcloth and ashes when the hurt begins to really hurt. Uh, chapter 37, verse 1, continuing. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it that he went his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. Well, it's about time. It's about time that he would bring God into the equation. The enemy's at the gate. The people are about to be taken over. I mean, the, the Assyrians were warriors. They, they had cavalry, chariots. They had, they, they had army, they had armor that Israel, Judah rather, couldn't compete with. It looked really bad. Verse 2. And he sent Elikim, who was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth unto Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos. It's about time to seek God. We're hurting. We're crying. God forgive us. Seems like that's the only time some people turn back to God. Verse 3. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, this day is the day of trouble and of rebuke and of blasphemy for the children are come to the birth and there's not strength to bring forth. Now, what this does let you know that we're talking about the in the future sense here, the birth of a new age. Okay. This is, this is how it's going to happen in the future sense at that birth of a new age. Uh, he said, they're, they're just done. There's nothing there that, uh, for them. They were misled because of Hezekiah, uh, misinformed because of Hezekiah. And now it's about time he was turning back to God and God's prophet Isaiah. Okay. Next verse, verse uh, 4. 
It may be the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that is left. You know, God will always forgive, all right, those that still sit and remain. But, um, you know, uh, here, this is blasphemy they're saying. But what, what they don't know, really, is that God sent them. God sent the Assyrian there. And, you know, the strange thing, all they had to do was listen to, their, to God's own word in chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. O Syrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. I mean, God had told him, I'm going to do it. When God makes a statement, if you're a little slow coming to the party, you need to catch up. Because God always forewarns. That's what prophecy is. For what tomorrow brings. So that you are prepared spiritually, mentally, and physically to withstand. But um, God had warned them. And he actu- actually, God actually used the enemy as his whipping boy there. Verse 5. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. We're going to have a little Bible lesson here. Verse 6. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say unto your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard. Wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria hath blasphemed me. They overstepped their bounds, see. God won't tolerate that. Verse 7, Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. When we get to verse 36, you'll see that come to pass. When God forewarns, it is written, It comes to pass. You can count on it. And this is why that 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 is written is so very important. When Jesus would, uh, when people would ask Jesus a question, he would say, haven't you read? It's in the word. Well, you should read. And you should read with understanding. Verse 8. So, Rabshakeh, returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. Verse 9, And he heard say concerning Tyrahika, king of Ethiopia, He has come forth to make war with thee. And when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, This is his final word. Listen to it. King of Assyria talking. 10. Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God in whom thou trusteth deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Now that, talk about blasphemy to the highest degree. Don't let your God deceive you. And God is already talking to them through Isaiah. God won't stand for this, okay? Verse 11. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly. And shalt thou be delivered? I mean, we've taken every country we come across. Well, they didn't have any armies. Is it any wonder? And, but here, uh, he's flexing his muscles 
in telling Hezekiah, don't listen to your God. This would be Yahweh, our Heavenly Father. Uh, we're coming back. He kind of misspoke. Uh, they won't be coming back. Okay. God will see to that. Verse 12. Have the gods of the nations delivered them which my fathers have destroyed as Gozan and Haran and Rezeph and the children of Eden which were in Telasher um, uh, and right there in the middle of, uh, the Assyria, of Assyria. Okay. Of course they're not. Of course they, they didn't uh, prevent it. But he's throwing out smoke here, okay? 13. Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arphad and the king of the city of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Ivi? Where are they? Well, they don't exist. Why? He done away with them and bring them into his one world system. Verse 14. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Finally, finally we have a ruler and a leader doing what he's supposed to do. is to bring Almighty God into the equation. Because I, I will assure you, without God's help, there are lost people at this time. Verse 15, and Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord saying, and we're getting it right this time, um, 16, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. And he's paying tribute and honoring our Heavenly Father, giving Him credit. 17, incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and, and see and hear all the words that Sennacherib, which has sent to reproach um, the living God. Uh, well, God's the one that sent him, so God's pretty well aware of what's going on. He just, Sennacherib just overstepped his bounds. Naturally, he doesn't, even though God sent him, he carried the message, but he doesn't believe in God. Okay. 18. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their countries. They, they whipped every one of them and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods. But the work of men's hands, wood and stone, therefore they have destroyed them. Kind of doing them a favor in a way, okay, getting rid of false religion. Verse 20, Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from, this, um, hand, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. And finally he asked it in a way, giving all credit to God. Not because he deserved it. Hezekiah didn't deserve it. He, he had repented right. But it takes a little while to build your uh, trust in God back up again. That is to say, to, to let God prove you, to test you. So he doesn't ask it for the fact that they are so good, but he asks it to, that they may know that thou art God, that thou art the Lord. Verse 21, Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent unto Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Whereas thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib king of Assyria, you're getting right down where the rubber meets the road. 22, this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. 
the daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. 23. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? And against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? You've insulted God. You just don't get away with that, friend. Even if God did send him there to do a job, he went a little overboard. Verse 24. But thy servants hast thou reproached, by thy servants hast thou reproached the Lord, and hast said, by the multitude of my chariots am I come up to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon, and I will cut down the tall cedars thereof and the choice fir trees thereof. And I will enter into the height of his border and the forest of his Carmel. That's to say his paradise, his garden. Um, big talk, okay? Big, big talk. 25. I have digged and drunk water, and with the sole of my feet have I dried up all the rivers of the besieged places. I did this. 26. Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it? Now here, the I here, we are switching. This is God speaking now, and it's kind of emphatic. The I is Yahweh this time, okay? Hast thou not heard long ago how I, that's our Heavenly Father, have done it, and of ancient times, that I have formed it? Now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldest be to lay waste defense cities into ruinous heaps. And naturally, when we look at this in the future sense, it would be Armageddon and Haman Gog, okay, in, in the ultimate. Never forget, the king of Assyria is always a type of Antichrist. You should have picked that up back in Isaiah chapter 14. Verse 27. Therefore, their habitation were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They, they um, were as the grass of the field and as the green herb, as the grass on the housetops and as corn blasted before it be growing up. Uh, in other words, God can kind of do things the way he wants to. Okay. Verse 28, but I know thy abode. I know, I know where you sit. I know where you live. And thy going out and thy coming in and thy rage against me. I'm well familiar with it. I know right where, you're, where you sit. 29. Because thy rage against me and thy tumult is come up into mine ears. God is hearing it. His insults. Therefore will I put my hook in thy nose and my bridle in thy lips, and I will turn thee back by the way by which thou camest. You should be able to remember Ezekiel chapter 38 here where God said, I put the hook in the mouth of the uh, atheistic nation and turn it around. God gets a little rough when it comes to handling the enemy, but they get the message. They get the message real good. And this should remind you, when I would say that this is, has reference um, to Haman, Gog, and um, Armageddon, that uh, this double documents it, okay? When you compare the chief prince Meshach in, in verse 1 and 2 of the 38th chapter of Ezekiel, chief prince is Rush, is Russia of today. Verse 30. And this shall be a sign unto thee. You shall eat this year such as groweth of itself 
and the second year that which springeth of the same, and in the third year sow ye and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. That's three and a half years. That should mean something to you. It always does. It again labels and brings us right back to that time with God on the throne, God in charge. And, um, you know, uh, poor old, um, um, when, when um, the Assyrian was, was such a, so gallant in his own mind, he felt he couldn't be controlled. God's about to show him that God's in charge, okay? Verse 31 to continue. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. You see, you should have known all the time we were studying the Assyrian trying to take Judah, you should know it wouldn't happen because the Assyrian took the ten tribes of the north and it would be Nebuchadnezzar who would take Judah. Okay. 32. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, God's children, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, shall do this. God can do whatever he chooses to do. Therefore, verse 33, Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. He's not going to do it. Verse 34. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return. And shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. Verse 35, For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake. Not the people necessarily, but so that the heathen would know he was God and they should listen. And for my servant David's sake, that would be the lineage through which Messiah would come. And for Messiah's sake, which is what? To say what? Emmanuel, God with us. For his sake, he does this. He defends this city. The city that David even founded, took it from the Jebusites when it was called Jebus and called it Jerusalem. Verse 36, listen carefully. Your father owned the throne. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpse. Hundred, that, that would be a um, hundred and eighty-five thousand dead. Don't, don't mess with God. I don't care what kind of army you have. I don't care where you come from. It is written, and things will always come to pass as it is written. God will not deviate from his path, the path that he has made for us to walk and tread upon. And naturally, that path is the way, and that way is Christ, that the offspring of David, that... Um, uh, would would cert and this would certainly put Nineveh back in its place. Um, you know, poor old Jonah. A lot of people don't understand Jonah. They think, well, God told him to go down and convert Nineveh, and, and he wanted to drown himself. The reason he wanted to drown himself is he didn't want to convert Nineveh because he knew Nineveh would overtake the ten northern tribes. And, and then God, to kind of uh, shake Jonah around a little bit, caused the fish to regurgitate him in the sight of some of the Ninevites, and they worshiped a fish god. So naturally, it's built in the works. They're going to worship Joel, uh, um, Jonah, 
because he came out of the great fish god they worship. And he had no trouble converting the whole town, and it really, it really got to him. And and um, God came by when he was had converted the city, and he was sitting on a hill and had planted a vine. He was mad. Why did you make me do that? God came along and laughed at him and said, "Does you good to be mad?" Because you did my work. What, he, what was he doing? What happened here? Well, actually, Jonah is the sign of Christ in the tomb for three and a half days. And his resurrection, that sign of Jonah, is the sign you got. And that brought forth salvation to us today. So, uh, God's on the throne and 185,000 dead corpse. Verse 37. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. He was, he was happy just to get away with his life and, and uh, to rest right there at Nineveh. Verse 38, to complete the chapter. And it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the house of Nishrach. That's, um, Nishrach is the great eagle. Okay. His God, not ours. Okay. That a Damalek, a Dramalek, which is to say, Splendor of the king. Malek is king and Dramalek splendor, splendor. And Sharezar, which is to say the prince of fire. He's got it all set up there. His son smote him with the sword. And they escaped into the land of Armenia. And Esarhaddon his son reigned in his stead. He was the victor. So, and so it was that uh, uh, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, was no more. He had accomplished what God would have him do. Well, what was that? Well, first off, he took captive the ten northern tribes. That is to say, the furthest north in Israel. And he, he took them into uh, to Assyria and later he would take them or, or they would escape over the Caucasus Mountains and they would be known where did all those people come from? God promised he would scatter them and they would become as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. Where are they? Okay. You, you, don't, you surely don't you're not going to accuse God of lying I don't think. That would not be healthy. Well, they went over those Caucasus mountains and they were later called Caucasians. They settled Europe. Those ten tribes. God didn't lose them. They kind of lost their way. They later, many of them migrated to this great nation. And so we serve our living God. And this great nation, the superpower of superpowers, is no fluke. It's no accident that God, when, when you put your hand in your pocket, if you're lucky enough to have, I'll say, a half dollar and pull it out, it'll say, in God we trust, because we do. We trust our Father because of His actions. When you repent and get right with Him, he, you have nothing to fear. He will take care of you. And that's how our Father is. That's how our Father operates. How fantastic that God took care of this people when they overstepped their bounds and he insulted the living God. I mean, you know, when he told, when he told Hezekiah, don't you be deceived by Yahweh that I'm not going to take this town because I'm going to. Well, 185,000 of them ended up dead. You don't go against God whoever you are. And the very last battle, Haman Gog, that I mentioned in Ezekiel 38, 
it's not fought. We do not fight, fight that uh, war with our army. Why? Because God fights it. He wants that nation that claim to be atheist, that disregard God, he wants them to know, hey, look at me. And look at these hailstones that weigh 180 pounds. And look at your troops. They are gone. I can cause that to pass. And he destroys them in the north country as it is written in Ezekiel 38 and 39. The same as he will do when Armageddon, which is a different battle, happen at the same time, but a different battle. Uh, Megiddo means the gathering place of the crowd. That's where the crowd of Lucifer and uh, his fallen angels will gather to deceive our, the people of the world. Then God will destroy them. Uh, when, when that comes to pass. Our Father is so loving, and our Father does really love his children. Um, we, let's go one more verse in chapter 38, okay? In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die, and not live. God forewarns. And that's how you can always, when you're in tune with God, you're prepared. Man only fears the unknown. And when you're in tune with God, you're in the know. Uh, don't ever forget that. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast.